You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. And by viewers like you. Well, the reason we're here tonight, and um, as many of you know, is that everywhere it seems but Israel, um, there's been this great recession, and Israel seems to have been spared uh, for the most part, and there, the economy's just been remarkably resilient. The MSCI index compiler said that as of May of this year, Israel was no longer going to be categorized as an emerging market, but rather as a developed market. That's huge in this, uh, in this world. And, um, and also that, you know, Israel would rank, um, you know, 18th out of 24 developed market countries with weighting similar to Denmark and Belgium. We're talking about a 60-year-old country here. You know, you have something like Teva, the biggest uh, generic drug maker in the world. You have someone like Warren Buffett who came in during 2006, sight unseen, and uh, for four, you know, invested $4 billion into Iskar for an 80% stake. Um, and needless to say, the technology uh, successes are just too numerous to mention here tonight. Um, but you have huge names that are constantly investing in the country, from IBM, Intel, Motorola, Cisco. I mean, Cisco alone, I think, has bought something like nine different companies. Um, I'm not sure, but I think you might have had a hand in some of those. Um, and uh, you know, needless to remind this audience that uh, this has all been done under less than uh, ideal or peaceable conditions. Um, so really, tonight's question uh, to our panel is, why has Israel been so successful? What's, what's in the secret sauce? What are we producing out there that, uh, you know, you have Jews, and I'll take that globally rather than just Israelis, that make up, you know, 0.2% of the world population um, and have disproportionately had, uh, you know, so much more international success. There's something kind of inchoate and inherent about the Israeli people to, you know, they've been dealt a hand, they've been given this stingy soil, they don't have a lot of fresh water. By dint of necessity, they have to innovate. And I think it's put in especially sharp relief now when you see all the voracious emerging economies wanting more oil, more food out of less arable land, and Israel is really in the spotlight. So um, I want to throw out that question uh, first to Dan. I know this is kind of part and parcel of your book, but what is it there's something else there beyond the military culture of Israel. And I find that it's not, you know, this story doesn't lend itself to Econ 101 comparative advantage. There is an amalgam of diaspora there, people coming from, from Russia, from my, you know, Iran, from <coughs> Persia, and everybody seems to be united by this idea to tease more out of less. Uh, what was the genesis of that? Um, the moment you focus on Jewish exceptionalism, you lose just about every audience but the Jews who want to constantly be reminded how exceptional they are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Haaretz, right, you lose her. Uh, um, you know, our whole point was there, while everything in Israel and the keys, all the keys to Israel's successful economic miracle or model, um, while, while some of them are unique to Judaism, not all of them are. There are some elements that are prescriptive, and we felt that if we if we focused on Jewish exceptionalism, we would completely lose interest from people who actually thought they could learn something from Israel, and there are some things that people can learn. There is another book, by the way, that deals quite effectively and seriously with the issue of Jewish exceptionalism. You may familiar, be familiar with it called The Israel Test, which is this book by George Gilder, who's a friend of mine. We actually spent some time doing interviews together in Israel. In many respects, it's a compliment, it's a compliment to our book. They work well together. But he really does focus exclusively on Jewish exceptionalism. It's a book I could have never written. It's a book a Jew could never have written. I'm glad a guy named Gilder wrote it uh, rather than, than a Jew. It's sort of the way I feel about the movie Inglorious Bastards. It's like no way a Jew could have made that movie, right? Only a guy named Quentin Tarantino could make that movie, not like Rabinovich, you know? Uh, 
but but I, I will say this. I think the military is an extremely, I mean, we can get into this if you want. I think the military is an extremely important factor. I think the role of immigration and assimilation is an extremely important factor. If you look at the history of the United States, during good times and bad, one of the constant shock absorbers in the American economy has been that we Americans have welcomed immigration as a source of economic strength, not as a burden. Uh, no matter what has been going on in the history of our country, the best and the brightest have wanted to come here from around the world. And it's only in the last few years, really the last decade, that you've watched, I mean, it, it's only at this point, if you go back all, over, all the way back to about the 1920s, in that entire swing of history, that you are starting to see now more and more discussion, a coarsening of the political debate around immigration, and beginning to view immigration and assimilation as a, as a burden, rather than a source of strength. And as I point out to my friends who think that America has uh, two liberal immigration policies. I point out that in the 1990s, Israel immigrated uh, about a fifth of its population. Uh, it would be the equivalent, proportionately, of the United States over the next 10 years, immigrating and assimilating about 60 million people. Uh, you want to talk about liberal immigration policy. And I also point out that when candidates run for office and for, uh, run for prime minister in Israel, the premiers I'll try to outbid each other. And under my premiership, you know, we'll immigrate one million people. Under my premiership, it'll be two million people. It's like eBay, you know, they're going back and forth. And so I do think the role, Israel is a leader in the world in immigration and assimilation. And it's not just the elites that they are immigrating. I mean, you go back to um, the founding years and the shanty towns and the refugees that were coming into Israel, living in these borderline refugee camps in the tent cities, they were the ultimate, what we call the ont ultimate entrepreneurs. Immigrants are the ultimate risk takers. They know how to start anew. They know how to face adversity. And you combine that with Israel's very generous and very innovative relative to the world, and certainly relative to the United States, policies for assimilating them. We do think that's a factor. Lastly, I'll say this. The role of R&D Israel spends the highest percentage of its economy on civilian research and development compared to any country in the world. Okay, that's, that's important and it's impressive. But when you climb behind the data, what's even more interesting is the culture and the ethos that you find in the laboratories. It's not just that Israel spends a lot on R&D. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of time in the Arab Muslim world and have over the years. And I will tell you that when, you know, there, there's a big debate going on in the Arab Muslim world about their own ticking time bomb, demographic ticking time bomb, which is if you look at the rate of reproduction among Arab, among Arab Muslims, uh, they are terrified that they have a huge problem keeping young Arab men employed and off the streets so they're not susceptible to radical madrasas and the allure of, of some of the radical mosques. And the number when you talk to Arab policymakers is 80 million. Between now and 2020, they have to create 80 million jobs. Uh, that's what they estimate. And their current model ain't going to work. And they're intrigued by the Israeli model. Now, they can't say that publicly, but they are. And when I spend time in the region, they're probing me about the Israeli model. And they say, well, you know, Israel spends so much on R&D, we can spend a lot on R&D. We have all this money. Certainly, we're awash in much more cash than the Israelis. And what I try to point out to them is it's not just spending a lot of money. It's what, what's the culture that goes on in that laboratory. And it is a culture of debate and probing and risk-taking and tolerance of failure that you don't find in many parts of the world. You don't find in many parts of Asia, and you certainly don't find in most parts of the Arab Muslim world. Th there is this dynamic in many parts of the world where there isn't this culture of questioning and probing and debating that you find in the Israeli laboratory. And I think you're right. You see it in many other parts of the Jewish world globally, but you don't see it as concentrated and as intensely, even in the Jewish diaspora, as you see it in Israel. You certainly don't see it you know, in, in Jewish corners, if you will, or where Jews are working in Silicon Valley. You see it. I mean, I don't want to say you don't see it at all. I don't want to overstate this point, but the intensity that you see in Israel is something we think is fundamental to, uh, fundamentally unique to Israel. Same question. Well, as one, one follow-up I wanted to see if you, you could also address that is, uh, Chemi, what was the really uh, uh, the tipping point of this? If I, a lot of people recall Israel as kind of a sleepy hyperinflation uh, case. A lot of the entrepreneurs I interviewed said that in the early 80s, they remember running to the, uh, running to the grocery. I think there was a currency devaluation. Um, that this was a legacy of Israel's collectivist past and the, the kibbutzes and you know the greasy slabs of uh, schnitzel and everything, and now it's suddenly a cutting edge. You know, Herzliya Pituah looks nothing like uh, 
the same city of even 10 or 15 years ago. What happened maybe in the mid to early 90s that was the tipping point? You know, we live in Israel, and Israel is not only Jews. Uh, we have, uh, in 7.5 million people, we have about 1.5 million people that are minorities. About 1.3 are Israeli Arabs. They're Israeli citizens. They vote to the Knesset. They can be elected, etc. cetera. Uh, we have about 100,000 Druze. We have Cherks. We have Bedouins. And while we have seen the, um, the uh, Israeli economy growing and uh, receiving tremendous amounts of investments and entrepreneurship and everything, there's been 20% uh, non-Jewish population that have not been participating in the game. I'm not talking about the entire minorities. Uh, some of the religious uh, people in the, in the population have not also participated in this. And I think uh, this is the right time, and it will take me back to the question that you asked, what was the tipping point? I think we are at a tipping point, a new tipping point, of integrating the entire society into the Israeli game, into the Israeli mission of becoming a state of science and technology, and assemble all the parts that have not been participating. Uh, in short, we are setting up a fund um, that will invest in the minorities in Israel. And we have started uh, uh, to focus on that first with the notion that it's a social thing that we should do in order to make our society stronger and, and more uh, uh, collaborative between Jews and non-Jews. Uh, but when we started to meet with young Arabs, um, Israeli Arabs, we, have, we were amazed. We were amazed by uh, the amazing people that we saw, the skill sets, the entrepreneurship, the new generation. It's a new generation that, that has the same uh, issue that we have as, as Israelis, as Jews who live in Israel. They have no alternatives. What can they do? And the new generation is very much unlike the old generation. They are much more uh, educated, they are much more skilled, they are much more ambitious, they are much more interested in being integrated within the society. And we have started to assemble this fund, and the notion was that we are going to invest in, you know, all the economy and things that are, the Israeli Arabs are doing. But as we started to talk to them, we saw that there is a lot of opportunities to invest in technology. First of all, we learned that if you talk about uh, medicine, healthcare, uh, the number of physicians and nurses and, and caregivers among the Arabs in Israel exceeding the number, uh, the relative number in the society. We also met with uh, some of you in the universities and the hospitals and we learned that uh, there are so many students and physicians, Israeli Arabs, that are great. And we started to say to ourselves, well, you know, the Arab internet world is developing, the mobile world is developing. The healthcare is developing, so why would we go and invest in a tahini factory or a halva factory or a coffee factory or real estate or other things? Let's invest in, in human resources. Let's try to s and see. And this is the experiment. Uh, if this is something that can be applied to the minorities as well. And it's about 20% of the population that um, provides about 7% of the GDP. It's a low income area, it's a low GDP area, and we are now coming up with this fund, which is called Al Bawader, which means, in, it's an Arabic word, of course, uh, it means in English early signs, or green shoots, if you will, or initiatives. And as we started to meet more and more people, we told ourselves, well, 50% of the fund will go into innovation and technology, and 50% will go into old economy. The more we are moving forward, the more we see the human talent that is out there and the opportunity. And I remember when I read the book Startup Nation, uh, it came very clear to me that um, when we absorbed one million Russians um, in a decade between the 90s, all, all the way through the 90s, this really saved the Israeli high-tech uh, sector because without that human talent, that human force, we would never be able to continue the full force that we had. We are now at a point that if we do not integrate these 20, 25% of the population, we will slow down. We have to have them in order to continue and grow.
Uh, at the time the uh, Russian immigrants came to Israel, I was working in a software company and we decided to recruit a hundred engineers coming from Russia. And I was running this project and um, when the uh, uh, Russian uh, engineers, uh, I saw that they are working very well, they are on time, they are working very well, but when it started to be 11, 11.30, I started to see that they are uncomfortable moving slightly laying off their things, stop working, and getting ready for lunch. And lunch was very long. <laughs> and then we saw that when we gave them a project, the project was never ended. They never finished the project. And we started to ask ourselves why. And I got close to some of them, and I understood that the country they, they came from, if you finish the project, and there was no project going on, you'd be fired. Nobody wanted to be fired. And you had to understand the cultural things in order to make them true Israelis. And I can tell you that some of our best investments um, that we made were not so great hadn't we have those great people coming from uh, uh, the Soviet Union or Russia. And I do believe that uh, the second million and a half people that we have in the minorities if we know really well how to work with them and integrate them, get them closer and integrated, uh, then I think we can see the same phenomena that we saw within the 90s. So assimilation and, and absorption is one thing, and integration and uh, inclusiveness, I think, is the next step that we're going to see. I would say, as someone who's been involved in government and politics for for many years in the United States and has been an observer of, or an analyst of, of government policies around the world, I have never seen a government program in which the government identified a problem, which was virtually no venture capital in Israel. They made a deliberate decision to create a venture capital industry. They provided the funding to do so. They sparked it. They went out and recruited partners from around the world. They got it going and then they got out. I mean, it, it was like the old ch the, the slogan for Chili's restaurant, get in, get out, and get on with life. I mean, but you never see that in government anywhere. I mean, most governments say, we're going to identify this problem, it's a short-term issue, we're going to get involved, we're going to create a program to solve it, and then we'll leave. And they never leave, because what happens is bureaucracies form, and people get, you know, get worried about their security of their jobs in government. You have entrenched interests that somehow have an agenda as it relates to the the future life of this government program. These government programs not only never end, they typically grow, they typically expand. And that was what was rare about Yosma. Now, Dan, I'm curious. Uh, you talk about the benefits of uh, military service, the, the maturity that accrues in, in you know, three-year service for men, two years for, for women. By the time that uh, they're in a pack of people where they're encouraged to ask questions, to debate, to look at problems in a different way, that they come out with a, with a tougher skin and a confidence. Uh, going into the working class. Um, is there something to be said for an opportunity cost, though, of, of Israel's military priorities and that a lot of people get called away from work? A lot of people are always on tenterhooks, uh, that they can't just be free to be their full entrepreneurial selves, that by dint of Israel's security situation, that it's also quite a limitation. Absolutely. I mean, the, the story I'm always fixated on is what Eitan Wertheimer told us, uh, who was running uh, ISCAR, which is this very innovative uh, machine tool manufacturing company, uh, and, and Eitan Wertheimer was in the midst of closing his deal, as Dahlia said, with his uh, uh, sale to Warren Buffett. And Katusha rockets started landing within yards of the ISCAR factories. Parenthetically, it's a great, great story is uh, Eitan Wertheimer, as we tell in the book, picks up the phone and calls Buffett because he's like worried that Buffett's going to get panicked. Uh, as the whole world is watching the second Lebanon war. And he calls Buffett and he says, Warren, I want you to know something, that on your television right now, you're seeing a war in Israel. But for our customers around the world, there will be no war. And what he meant by that is, hell or high water, we will not be late on a single delivery during the war. Sort of, we were going to prove that even in spite of the war, uh, we, can, we can perform um, and, and our supply chain won't be uh, impacted at all. Now, this was obviously difficult to do when you have the stress and the pressure of Katusha rockets landing right near your factory. But what was less reported at the time is how many employees of his were called up for Miluim to go fight. So not only was he living in a wartime situation, but he was understaffed. Uh, and this is a huge problem. 
for Israel's economy. It's a huge burden for Israel's economy. I would argue, though, that as serious as that burden is, uh, it is more than eclipsed by the benefit Israel gets from the fact that almost every single Israeli gets this crucible leadership experience at a very young age. Uh, they learn how to manage people, how to have lives on the line, not only their own lives, but other people's lives, what it means to have a real sense of perspective. Uh, as one Israeli venture capitalist put it to me, he says, look, I go every morning to a coffee shop um, to get my cappuccino on the way to work, and this coffee shop has been bombed twice. He said, so every morning I walk in and I get my cappuccino, and you're just not quite sure how it's going to go. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, you know, when, when you have that perspective about getting your cappuccino on the way to work, you, have a sort of, you get a little less stressed out if you didn't get the right valuation on your next round of financing <laughs> that, you know, that otherwise would keep you up at night. Uh, I would say that Israel is a very risk-centric society, and I think that, that risk-centricity comes in part from the military experience. It's not, I mean, it's not just the military experience, Robin. It's the nature, the unique nature of the Israeli military experience. The Israeli military is one of the most improvisational militaries in the world. It is one of the least hierarchical militaries in the world. If you look at the pyramid that represents the command structure of the Israeli military and you compare it to the pyramid of military structures anywhere else in the world, anywhere in the world, where at the tip of the pyramid you have the officer corps and at the bottom horizontal line you have the rank and file, the enlisted men and women. Israel has the most narrow tip of any military in the world. They have very few officers. It's a tiny officer corps, which means there are very few bosses, which means you, you don't check a lot. You actually make decisions on your own. It is enormous emphasis on improvising, which is an, a fantastic uh, quality, trait, skill set to inculcate your young people with, particularly those who want to go run and start companies. Um, so I, I mean, don't, don't take my word for it. I mean, Eric Schmidt, the CEO and president of Google, and, and others, the heads of C Intel and eBay and Cisco have said, all of them said some version of the following. You take the average Israeli 25-year-old and you put him or her up against their peers anywhere else in the world. Any day of the week, they'll hire the Israeli. Because at age 25, in most parts of the world, you simply don't have people who've had this leadership experience at a young age. Then they go to university at a completely different maturity level. So they have an unbel unbelievably different, jarringly different sense of perspective. And they come out at 25 years old just in a completely different place. The OECD did this study, IMD, ranking 60 nations, best places to do business in the world. And one of the questions they asked is for businesses that do business in that economy, they say, which university system in the world produces graduates that meet the needs, best meet the needs of a competitive private sector economy? That's the question. Israel ranked like second or third in the world. Now, the dirty little secret is I think Israel's university system had very little to do with it. It's when they take the average Israeli 25-year-old, yes, they're coming out of university, but it's almost unfair because what also they've had is this incredible leadership and entrepreneur training that most people around the world don't get. So I do think there's a burden to your point, Robin, by, by, the, the, by, the, by the sacrifice that many companies have to make because their, their employees get called up. On the other hand, the pool of talent that Israel has at its disposal is in that combination of, of you know, the formal education with that leadership training is so unique in the world and so attractive to so many multinationals. It's hard to argue that um, I think Israel would be where it would be if they weren't creating this boot camp for, for Israeli entrepreneurs. The Israeli Defense Forces is the best university that Israel can, ha can have. And I think that there is a, a genuine effort today to really make it a university. The basic vision, the basic idea is that every soldier, uh, men and women, uh, will end their military service with a first degree. And if they don't, what they learned in military service about themselves, about dealing with um, obstacles and challenges, extracting the most out of themselves, is something that you cannot learn in any university. So, you know, I wish we had peace and I wish we never had to fight and keep such a strong uh, a military force. But by doing that, I think that we are earning a lot. And I think, as, as Dan said, we gain much more than, than we lose. Companies in Israel die hard. 
they just don't die. And, and uh, part of it, of course, some of them do. But part of it is the reason that the people that are running those companies, they know how to rise again when they fail. This is so much different from any entrepreneurial arena you see in other places. It's another aspect to military service. I am struck by a study I was presented by some officials within the Israeli government that surveyed perceptions of Israel around the world. And they went and, in, and, and purposely, quite deliberately, went and surveyed two polar opposite groups, Israel's fiercest critics around the world and Israel's most intense and loyal allies. And not surprisingly, those two groups had jarringly different perceptions of Israel on just about every issue, except for one question, which was amazing. When they asked one question, they got a, a tremendous commonality in answers between these two groups. And the question was, was, what is the first word that comes to mind when you think of Israel? What is the first word that you associate with Israel? And the, the enemies or the critics of Israel and the friends of Israel in high numbers came up with the same word, conflict. Now, they obviously have different views about who's responsible for the conflict and what the history of the conflict is about, but at the end of the day, they associate Israel with conflict and chaos. That is especially worrisome to me, and I presume many people in this room, because while we are all, the, the international community is very familiar with the concreteness and the, and the tangible nature of the military campaign against Israel. Right? We, we, you know, the day doesn't go by where we're not reading a news story about Iran's nuclear program. I mean, we're very aware in its support for Hezbollah, and we can go on and on and on, in support for Hamas. We're all very aware of the, of the very physical security nature, military threat against Israel. What, what almost worries me more, not because it's necessarily more dangerous, but it worries me more because it's more subtle, and it's perhaps more incremental, but no less systematic and no less strategic, is the non-military campaign against Israel, which is the campaign of delegitimization. Which is to raise this debate. It's an interesting, by the way, it's an interesting debate. It's an interesting academic debate. You know, there are many post-colonial experiments that worked, and there are many post-colonial experiments that didn't work. And maybe Israel, you know, with all its problems and all the problems it contributes to the world, and boy, maybe it should be one of those experiments that just didn't work out. And, and the scary part about this is it's actually not. The intention, the architects of this campaign, of this discussion, don't want it to be actually just an academic debate. They actually want it to be a very actionable uh, debate. And, and I, I think it is real, it is alive, it is vibrant, this campaign of delegitimization. I'm a great believer that innovation and science will be a bridge between Jews and Arabs. I think for us the first step will be uh, Israeli Jews and Arabs before we talk to other Arabs from uh, our other countries. First we need to learn to live um, and integrate the Arab, the Arab society in Israel with the Jewish society in Israel. And uh, when we come and talk to the Palestinians and we talk about uh, the Jordanians and others, uh, I think even if they don't say that, uh, they, they always first look at what we do with our own uh, citizens that are Arabs. And I believe that the more uh, we will integrate, uh, the more peaceful the environment will be. I had a, an opportunity in our fund, by the way, the fund that in, we are investing in the minorities, we have also Palestinian investors. And they know that whatever we are investing is going into the Israeli Arabs. It's not going into the uh, Palestinian Authority. But still, there are great believers in the potential. And uh, they have decided to uh, support us uh, and invest. And I was a guest. Um, I visited um, Ramallah uh, a couple of months ago was invited by a businessman. I had to sign documents that I literally uh, live my life away, <laughs> if you will. Uh, nobody has, assumes responsibility, but I went there, and uh, I was quite amazed to see how peaceful the uh, Ramallah was, uh, much more than I expected, uh, almost normal life. Uh, they're experiencing now uh, economic growth, over 7% annually. Just imagine that the Middle East would grow by 10% annually.
That would be a true climate change for the good. Um, I visited a software company in Ramallah that is doing development services for Israeli companies. I met with 80 uh, engineers in Ramallah. Uh, obviously, uh, they can come here and there to Israel to visit uh, the companies they work for. Uh, the Israeli companies cannot visit them. Uh, there is a startup company, I think you mentioned in the book, Ghost, which is an Israeli entrepreneur and the developers are um, in, in uh, the Palestinian Authority. Um, and I think in the last six months, I had an opportunity to visit three areas, very interesting areas. One was in Nazareth, which in Israel, a company called Galil Software, a software company from uh, um, uh, the uh, minorities in Israel. Again, we're talking about 85 to 90 engineers, Israeli Arabs, who are developing products for Israeli companies. Great people, by the way, and it can grow very fast to hundreds of uh, uh, employees. I also had an opportunity to visit in, uh, in a religious uh, city in Israel, which is called Modi'in Elite. 50,000 people, growing by 15% annually, 60 babies on a weekly basis. Uh, like two classes every, uh, every week. And they started to employ uh, religious women. Uh, they call it Talpiot. The company name is Matrix. And I saw 500 uh, women, religious women, working and developing technologies, great minds. And I could walk in the rooms. I thought nobody would, would allow me to walk and talk to them, and it was amazing. And when I see the religious people in Israel and the Palestinians and Israeli Arabs starting to develop software, uh, I'm becoming very optimistic. And I do think that what we do, what we did in the first uh, 20 years of venture, we really worked on growing the Israeli economy, and this is our prime focus. Don't, don't be uh, confused by what I'm saying. Um, our prime target is to grow Israel economically, to make it a state of science and technology, with, which is uh, uh, stated and based on, on export and innovation and growth. Uh, but at the same time, I think our role is also to start integrating, uh, first, our own minorities, and secondly, our neighbors. And I believe that over time, it will help us bridge some gaps between us and our neighbors. And as I said, science and technology is the bridge. Thank you guys so, so much. And on that note, I just want to say on behalf of my wife, Dina and Mark, uh, you guys are, are the future. You're the future of Judaism. Uh, many of you have heard me say this. But in the United States, 65% of non-Orthodox Jews marry non-Jews. Just once more, 65% of non-Orthodox Jews marry non-Jews. So you don't need to be an enormous business success to figure out that if that keeps going, there aren't going to be a whole lot of us left. Judaism is a wonderful thing. We look at it differently. Each of us have a different perspective. But it's something that really has never been equaled in any civilization. So that's why Dean and I sponsor events like this. Nothing makes us happier, nothing makes us happier than seeing such a large, beautiful, wonderful group of young people come to these events. So we thank you for coming.